Dimer by C. S. Lewis Nine nights I hung upon the tree, wounded with the spear, as an offering to Odin, myself sacrificed to myself. Havamal Canto One. You stranger, long before your glance can light upon these words, time will have washed away the moment when I first took pen to write, with all my road before me, yet today, here if at all we meet, the unfashioned clay, ready to both our hands, both hushed to see, that which is nowhere yet come forth and be. This moment, if you join me, we begin, a partnership where both must toil to hold the clue that I caught first. We lose or win, together. If you read, you are enrolled. And first a marvel, who could have foretold that in the city which men called in scorn the perfect city, Dimer, could be born? There you'd have thought the gods were smothered down forever and the keys were turned on fate. No hour was left unchartered in that town, and love was in a schedule, and the state chose for eugenic reasons who should mate, with whom and when, each idle song and dance was fixed by law and nothing left to chance. For some of the last Platonists had founded that city of old, and mastery they made, an island of what ought to be, surrounded by this gross world of easier light and shade. All answering to the master's dream they laid, the strong foundations, torturing into stone each bubble that the academy had blown. This people were so pure, so law-abiding, so logical, they made the heavens afraid. They sent the very swallows into hiding, by their appalling chastity dismayed. More soberly the lambs in springtime played, because of them, and ghosts dissolved in shame before their common sense, till Dimer came. At Dimer's birth no comet scared the nation, the public crash engulfed him with the rest, and twenty separate boards of education closed round him. He was passed through every test, was vaccinated, numbered, washed, and dressed, proctored, inspected, whipped, examined weekly, and for some nineteen years he bore it meekly. For nineteen years they worked upon his soul, refining, chipping, molding, and adorning. Then came the moment that undid the whole, the ripple of rude life without a warning. It came in lecture time one April morning. Alas for laws and locks, reproach and praise. Who ever learned to censor the spring days? A little breeze came stirring to his cheek. He looked up to the window. A brown bird, perched on the sill, bent down to wet his beak. With darting head, poor Dimer watched and stirred, uneasily. The lecturer's voice he heard, still droning from the dais. The narrow room was drowsy, over-solemn, filled with gloom. He yawned, and a voluptuous laziness tingled down all his spine and loosed his knees. Slow-drawn, like an invisible caress, he laughed. The lecturer stopped, like one that sees a ghost, then frowned and murmured, Silence, please. That moment saw the soul of Dimer hang in the balance. Louder then his laughter rang. The whole room watched with unbelieving awe. He rose and staggered rising. From his lips broke yet again the idiot-like guffaw. He felt the spirit in his fingertips. Then swinging his right arm, a wide ellipse, yet lazily he struck the lecturer's head. The old man tittered, lurched, and dropped down dead. Out of the silent room, out of the dark, into the sunstream, Dimer passed, and there, the sudden breezes, the high-hanging lark, the milk-white clouds sailing in polished air, suddenly flashed about him like a blare of trumpets, and no cry was raised behind him. His class sat dazed. They dared not go to find him. Yet wonderfully some rumor spread abroad, an inarticulate sense of life renewing. In each young heart, he whistled down the road. Men said, there's Dimer. Why, what's Dimer doing? I don't know. Look, there's Dimer. 
far pursuing, with troubled eyes, a long mysterious, oh, sighed from a hundred throats to see him go. Down the white street and past the gate and forth, beyond the wall he came to grassy places. There was a shifting wind to west and north, with clouds in healing squadron running races. The shadows following on the sunlight's traces cross the whole field and each wild flower within it, with change of wavering glories every minute. There was a river flushed with rains between the flat fields and a forest's willowy edge. A sauntering pace he shuffled on the green. He kicked his boots against the crackly sedge and tore his hands in many a furzy hedge. He saw his feet and ankles gilded round with buttercups that carpeted the ground. He looked back then. The line of a low hill had hid the city's towers and domes from sight. He stopped. He felt a break of sunlight spill around him sudden waves of searching light. Upon the earth was green and gold and white, smothering his feet. He felt his city dress an insult to that April cheerfulness. He said, I've worn this dust heap long enough. Here goes. And forthwith, in the open field, he stripped away that prison of sad stuff. Socks, jacket, shirt, and breeches off he peeled, and rose up mother naked with no shield against the sun, then stood a while to play with bare toes dabbling in cold river clay. Forward again, and sometimes leaping high, with arms outspread as though he would embrace, in one act all the circle of the sky. Sometimes he rested in a leafier place, and crushed the wet, cool flowers against his face. And once he cried aloud, O world, O day, let, let me, and then found no prayer to say. Up furrows still unpierced with earliest crop he marched. Through woods he strolled from flower to flower, and over hills, as ointment drop by drop, preciously meted out, so hour by hour the day slipped through his hands, and now the power failed in his feet from walking. He was done, hungry and cold. That moment sank the sun. He lingered, looking up, he saw ahead the black and bristling frontage of a wood, and over it the large sky swimming red, freckled with homeward crows. Surprised he stood, to feel that wideness quenching his hot mood. Then shouted, Trembling darkness, trembling green, What do you mean, wild wood, what do you mean? He shouted, but the solitude received his noise into her noiselessness, his fire into her calm. Perhaps he half believed some answer yet would come to his desire. The hushed air quivered softly like a wire upon his voice. It echoed, it was gone. The quiet and the quiet dark went on. He rushed into the wood, he struck and stumbled on hidden roots, he groped and scratched his face, the little birds woke chattering where he fumbled, the stray cat stood paw-lifted in mid-chase, there is a windless calm in such a place, a sense of being indoors, so crowded stand the living trees watching on every hand, a sense of trespass such as in the hall of the wrong house one time to me befell. Groping between the hat-stand and the wall, a clear voice from above me like a bell, the sweet voice of a woman asking, Well? No more than this, and as I fled I wondered into whose alien story I had blundered. A like thing fell to Dimer, bending low, feeling his way he went, the curtained air sighed into sound above his head, as though stringed instruments and horns were riding there. It passed, and at its passing stirred his hair. He stood intent to hear, he heard again, and checked his breath half-drawn, as if with pain. That music could have crumbled proud belief, with doubt, or in the bosom of the sage, madden the heart that had outmastered grief, and flood with tears the eyes of frozen age, and turn the young man's feet to pilgrimage. So sharp it was, so sure a path it found soulward with stabbing wounds of bitter sound. It died out on the middle of a note, 
as though it failed at the urge of its own meaning. It left him with life quivering at the throat, limbs shaken and wet cheeks and body leaning, with strain towards the sound and senses gleaning the last, least ebbing ripple of the air, searching the emptied darkness, muttering, Where? Then followed such a time as is forgotten with morning light, but in the passing seems unending, where he grasped the branch was rotten, where he trod forth in haste the forest streams, laid wait for him, like men in fever dreams, climbing an endless rope, he labored much and gained no ground, he reached and could not touch. And often out of darkness like a swell that grows up from no wind upon blue sea, he heard the music unendurable, in stealing sweetness wind from tree to tree, battered and bruised in body and soul was he, when first he saw a little lightness growing ahead, and from that light the sound was flowing. The trees were fewer now, and gladly nearing that light he saw the stars, for sky was there, and smoother grass, white flowered, a forest clearing, set in seven miles of forest, secreter than valleys in the tops of clouds, more fair than greenery under snow or desert water, or the white peace descending after slaughter. As some who have been wounded beyond healing, wake or half-wake, once only, and so bless, far off the lamplight traveling on the ceiling, a disk of pale light filled with peacefulness, and wonder if this is the CCS, or home, or heaven, or dreams, then sighing when wise ignorant death before the pains begin. So Dimer in the woodlawn blessed the light, a still light, rosy, clear, and filled with sound. Here was some pile of building which the night made larger, spiry shadows rose all round, but through the open door appeared profound recesses of pure light, fire with no flame, and out of that deep light the music came. Tiptoes he slunk towards it where the grass was twinkling in a lane of light before the archway. There was neither fence to pass, nor word of challenge given, nor bolted door, but where it's open, open evermore, no knocker and no porter and no guard, for very strangeness entering in grows hard. Breathe not, speak not, walk gently, someone's here. Why have they left their house with the door so wide? There must be someone, Dimer hung in fear, upon the threshold, longing and big-eyed. At last he squared his shoulders, smote his side, and called, I'm here, now let the feast begin, I'm coming now, I'm Dimer, and went in. Canto Two. More light, another step and still more light, opening ahead. It swilled with soft excess, his eyes yet quivering from the dregs of night, and it was nowhere more and nowhere less. In it no shadows were, he could not guess its fountain. Wandering round, around he turned, still on each side the level glory burned. Far in the dome to where his gaze was lost, the deepening roof shone clear as stones that lie in shore beneath pure seas, the isles that crossed, like forests of white stone their arms on high, past pillar after pillar dragged his eye, in unobscured perspective till the sight was weary, and there also was the light. Look with my eyes, conceive yourself above, and hanging in the dome, and thence through space look down, see Dimer, dwarfed and naked, move, a white blot on the floor, at such a pace, as boats that hardly seem to have changed place, once in an hour when from the cliffs we spy, the same ship always smoking towards the sky. The shouting mood had withered from his heart, the oppression of huge places wrapped him round. A great misgiving sent its fluttering dart deep into him, some fear of being found, some hope to find he knew not what. The sound of music never ceasing took the role of silence, and like silence numbed his soul. Till as he turned a corner, his deep awe broke with a sudden start, 
for straight ahead far off a wild-eyed naked man he saw that came to meet him and beyond was spread yet further depth of light with quickening tread he leaped towards the shape then stopped and smiled before a mirror wondering like a child beside the glass unguarded for the claiming like a great patch of flowers upon the wall hung every kind of clothes silk feathers flaming leopard skin furry mantles like the fall of deep midwinter snows upon them all hung the faint smell of cedar and the dyes were bright as blood and clear as morning skies he turned from the white specter in the glass and looked at these remember he had worn through winter slush through summer flowers and grass one kind of solemn stuff since he was born with badge of year and rank he laughed in scorn and cried here is no law nor i to see nor leave of entry given why should there be have done with that you threw it all behind henceforth i ask no license where i need it's on 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 though i go mad and blind though knees ache and lungs labor and feet bleed or else it's home again to sleep and feed and work and hate them always and obey and loathe the punctual rise of each new day he made mad work among them as he dressed with motley choice and litter on the floor and each thing as he found it seemed the best he wondered that he had not known before how fair a man he was i'll creep no more in secret dimer said but i'll go back and drive them all to freedom on this track he turned towards the glass the space looked smaller behind him now himself in royal guise filled the whole frame a nobler shape and taller till suddenly he started with surprise catching by chance his own familiar eyes fevered yet still the same without their share of bravery undeceived and watching there yet as he turned he cried the rest remain if they rebelled if they should find me here we'd pluck the whole taut fabric from the strain hew down the city let live earth appear old men and barren women whom through fear we have suffered to be masters in our home hide hide for we are angry and we come thus feeding on vain fancy covering round his hunger his great loneliness arraying in facile dreams until the qualm was drowned the boy went on through endless arches straying with casual tread he sauntered manly playing at manhood lest more loss of faith betide him till lo he saw a table set beside him when dimer saw this sight he leaped for mirth he clapped his hands his eye lit like a lover's he had a hunger in him that was worth ten cities here was silver glass and covers cold peacock prawns and aspic eggs of plovers raised pies that stood like castles gleaming fishes and bright fruit with broad leaves around the dishes if ever you have passed a cafe door and lingered in the dusk of a june day fresh from the road sweat sodden and foot sore and heard the plates clink and the music play with laughter with white tables far away with many lights conceive how dimer ran to table looked once round him and began that table seemed unending here and there were broken meats bread crumbled flowers defaced a napkin with white petals on a chair a glass already tasted still to taste it seemed that a great host had fed in haste and gone yet left a thousand places more untouched wherein no guest had sat before there in the lonely splendor dimer ate as thieves eat ever watching half in fear he blamed his evil fortune i come late whose board was this what company sat here what women with wise mouths what comrades dear who would have made me welcome as the one freeborn of all my race and cried well done remember yet again he had grown up on rations and on scientific food at common boards with water in his cup one mess alike for every day and mood but here at his right hand a flagon stood he raised it paused before he drank and laughed i'll drown their perfect city in this draught 
He fingered the cold neck. He saw within, like a strange sky, some liquor that foamed blue and murmured. Standing now with pointed chin and head thrown back, he tasted. Rapture flew through every vein. That moment louder grew the music and swelled forth a trumpet note. He ceased and put one hand up to his throat. Then heedlessly he let the flagon sink in his right hand. His staring eyes were caught, in distance as of one who tries to think, a thought that is still waiting to be thought. There was a riot in his heart that brought the loud blood to the temples. A great voice sprang to his lips unsummoned with no choice. Ah, but the eyes are open, the dream is broken. To sack the perfect city? A fool's deed. For Dimer, folly of follies I have spoken. I am the wanderer, new-born, newly freed. A thousand times they have warned me of men's greed, for joy, for the good that all desire, but never, till now I knew the wild heat of the endeavor. Some day I will come back to break the city, not now, perhaps when age is white and bleak, not now. I am in haste, O oh God, the pity of all my life till this, groping and weak, the shadow of itself, but now to seek that true most ancient glory whose white glance was lost through the whole world by evil chance. I was a dull, cowed thing from the beginning, Dimer the drudge, the black leg who obeyed. Desire shall teach me now. If this be sinning, good luck to it. O oh, splendor long delayed, beautiful world of mine, O oh, world arrayed, for bridal, flower and forest, wave and field, I come to be your lover, loveliest yield. World, I will prove you, lest it should be said, there was a man who loved the earth, his heart was nothing but that love. With doting tread he worshipped the loved grass, and every start of every bird from cover, the least part of every flower he held in awe, yet earth gave him no joy between his death and birth. I know my good is hidden at your breast. There is a sound of great good in my ear, like wings, and oh, this moment is the best. I shall not fail, I taste it, it comes near. As men from a dark dungeon see the clear stars shining and the filled streams far away, I hear your promise booming and obey. This forest lies a thousand miles, perhaps, beyond where I am come, and farther still the rivers wander seaward with smooth laps, and there is cliff and cottage, tower and hill. Somewhere before the world's end I shall fill my spirit at earth's pap, for earth must hold one rich thing sealed as dimers from of old. One rich thing, or it may be more than this, might I not reach the borders of a land that ought to have been mine, and there the bliss of free speech, there the eyes that understand, the men free-grown, not modelled by the hand of masters, men that know or men that seek, they will not gape and murmur when I speak. Then as he ceased amid the farther wall, he saw a curtained and low lintel door, dark curtains, sweepy fold, night-purple pall, he thought he had not noticed it before. Sudden desire for darkness overbore his will and drew him towards it. All was blind within. He passed. The curtains closed behind. He entered in a void. Night-scented flowers breathed there, but this was darker than the night that is most black with beating thunder showers. A disembodied world where depth and height and distance were unmade. No seam of light showed through. It was a world not made for seeing, one pure, one undivided sense of being. Through darkness smooth as amber, warily, slowly, he moved. The floor was soft beneath his feet. A cool smell that was holy and unholy, sharp like the very spring and roughly sweet, blew towards him, and he felt his fingers meet, broad leaves and wiry stems that at his will unclosed before and closed behind him still. With body intent he felt the foliage quiver on breast and thighs. With groping arms he made wide passes in the air, a sacred shiver of joy from the heart center oddly strayed to every nerve. Deep sighing, much afraid, 
much wondering he went on, then stooping found a knee depth of warm pillows on the ground. And there it was sweet rapture to lie still, eyes open on the dark, a flowing health bathed him from head to foot, and great good will rose springing in his heart and poured its wealth outwards, then came a hand as if by stealth out of the dark and touched his hand, and after the beating silence budded into laughter. A low grave laugh and rounded like a pearl, mysterious, filled with home, he opened wide his arms. The breathing body of a girl slid into them. From the world's end, with the stride of seven-league boots, came passion to his side. Then, meeting mouths, soft-falling hair, a cry, heart-shaken flank, sudden cool-folded thigh. The same night swelled the mushroom in earth's lap, and silvered the wet fields. It drew the bud from hiding and led on the rhythmic sap, and sent the young wolves thirsting after blood, and wheeling the big seas made ebb and flood along the shores of earth, and held these two in dead sleep till the time of morning dew. Canto Three. He woke, and all at once before his eyes, the pale spires of the chestnut trees in bloom rose waving, and beyond, dove-colored skies. But where he lay was dark, and, out of gloom, he saw them through the doorway of a room, full of strange scents and softness, padded deep with growing leaves, heavy with last night's sleep. He rubbed his eyes. He felt that chamber wreathing, new sleepiness around him. At his side, he was aware of warmth and quiet breathing. Twice he sank back, loose-limbed and drowsy-eyed. But the wind came even there, a sparrow cried, and the wood shone without. Then Dimer rose, just for one glance, he said, and went tiptoes. Out into crisp grey air and drenching grass, the whitened cobweb sparkling in its place, clung to his feet. He saw the wagtail pass beside him and the thrush, and from his face felt the thin-scented winds divinely chase the flush of sleep. Far off he saw, between the trees, long morning shadows of dark green. He stretched his lazy arms to their full height, yawning and sighed and laughed, and sighed anew, then wandered farther, watching with delight how his broad naked footprints stained the dew pressing his foot to feel the cold come through, between the spreading toes, then wheeling round, each moment to some new, shrill forest sound. The wood with its cold flowers had nothing there, more beautiful than he, new waked from sleep, new born from joy, his soul lay very bare, that moment to life's touch, and pondering deep, now first he knew that no desire could keep these hours for always, and that men do die, but, oh, the present glory of lungs and eye. He thought, at home they are waking now. The stair is filled with feet. The bells clang far from me. Where am I now? I could not point to where the city lies from here. Then suddenly, if I were here alone, these woods could be a frightful place. But now I have met my friend, who loves me, we can talk to the road's end. Thus quickening with the sweetness of the tale of his new love, he turned. He saw between the young leaves where the palace walls showed pale, with chilly stone, but far above the green, springing like cliffs in air, the towers were seen, making more quiet yet the quiet dawn. Thither he came, he reached the open lawn. No bird was moving here. Against the wall, out of the unscythed grass, the nettle grew. The doors stood open wide, but no footfall rang in the colonnades. Whispering through arches and hollow halls, the light wind blew. His awe returned. He whistled, then no more. It's better to plunge in by the first door. But then the vastness threw him into doubt. Was this the door that he had found last night? Or that beneath the tower? Had he come out this side at all? As the first snow falls light, with following rain before the year grows white, so the first dim foreboding touched his mind. 
gently as yet, and easily thrust behind. And with it came the thought, I do not know her name, no, nor her face. But still his mood ran blithely as he felt the morning glow about him, and the earth smell in the wood seemed waking for long hours that must be good, here in the unfettered lands that knew no cause for grudging out of reach of the old laws. He hastened to one entry. Up the stair, beneath the pillared porch, without delay, he ran, then halted suddenly, for there, across the quiet threshold, something lay, a bundle, a dark mass that barred the way. He looked again, and lo, the formless pile, under his eyes, was moving all the while. And it had hands, pale hands of wrinkled flesh, puckered and gnarled with vast antiquity, that moved. He eyed the sprawling thing afresh, and bit by bit, so faces come to be in the red coal, yet surely he could see that the swathed hugeness was uncleanly human, a living thing, the likeness of a woman. In the center a draped hummock marked the head, thence flowed the broader lines with curve and fold, spreading as oak roots do. You would have said a man could hide among them and grow old in finding a way out. Breasts manifold, as of the Ephesian Artemis might be, under that robe, the face he did not see. And all his being answered, not that way. Never a word he spoke. Stealthily creeping, back from the door he drew. Quick, no delay. Quick, quick, but very quiet. Backward peeping, till fairly out of sight. Then shouting, leaping, shaking himself he ran, as puppies do, from bathing, till that door was out of view. Another gate, and empty. In he went, and found a courtyard open to the sky. Amidst it dripped a fountain. Heavy scent of flowers was here. The foxglove standing high sheltered the whining wasp. With hasty eye he travelled round the walls. One doorway led within. One showed a further court ahead. He ran up to the first, a hungry lover, and not yet taught to endure, not blunted yet, but weary of long waiting to discover that loved one's face. Before his foot was set on the first stair, he felt the sudden sweat cold on his sides. That sprawling mass in view, that shape, the horror of heaviness, here too. He fell back from the porch, not yet, not yet. There must be other ways where he would meet no watcher in the door. He would not let the fear rise, nor hope falter, nor defeat be entered in his thoughts. A sultry heat seemed to have filled the day. His breath came short, and he passed on into that inner court. And like a dream the sight he feared to find was waiting here. Then cloister, path, and square he hastened through, down paths that needed blind, traced and retraced his steps. The thing sat there, in every door, still watching, everywhere, behind, ahead, all round. So, steady now, lest panic comes. He stopped. He wiped his brow. But as he strove to rally came the thought that he had dreamed of such a place before, knew how it all would end. He must be caught, early or late, no good. But all the more he raged with passionate will that overbore that knowledge, and cried out, and beat his head, raving upon the senseless walls, and said, Where, where, dear, look once out, give but one sign, it's I, I, Dimer, are you chained and hidden? What have they done to her? Loose her, she is mine. Through stone and iron, haunted and hag-ridden, I'll come to you, no stranger nor unbidden. It's I, don't fear them, shout above them all, can you not hear? I'll follow at your call. From every arch the echo of his cry returned. Then all was silent, and he knew there was no other way. He must pass by that horror, tread her down, force his way through, or die upon the threshold. And this, too, had all been in a dream. He felt his heart beating as if his throat would burst apart. There was no other way. He stood a space and pondered it. Then, gathering up his will, he went to the next door. The pillared place beneath the porch was dark. The air was still, moss on the steps. He felt her presence fill the threshold with dull life. Here, too, was she. 
This time he raised his eyes and dared to see. Ha! Only an old woman, but the size, the old, old matriarchal dreadfulness, immovable, intolerable, the eyes, hidden, the hidden head, the winding dress, corpse-like, the weight of the brute that seemed to press upon his heart and breathing. Then he heard his own voice, strange and humbled, take the word. "'Good mother, let me pass. I have a friend to look for in this house.' I slept the night and feasted here. It was my journey's end. I found it by the music and the light, and no one kept the doors, and I did right to enter, did I not? Now, mother, pray, let me pass in. Good mother, give me way. The woman answered nothing, but he saw the hands like crabs still wandering on her knee. Mother, if I have broken any law, I'll ask a pardon once. Then let it be. Once is enough and leave the passage free. I am in haste, and though it were a sin, by all the laws you have, I must go in. Courage was rising in him now. He said, Out of my path, old woman, for this cause I am new-born, new-freed, and here new-wed, that I might be the breaker of bad laws. The frost of old forbiddings breaks and thaws wherever my feet fall. I bring to birth under its crust the green, ungrudging earth. He had started, bowing low, but now he stood, stretched to his height, his own voice in his breast, made misery pompous, firing all his blood. Enough, he cried, give place, you shall not wrest my love from me, I journey on a quest you cannot understand, whose strength shall bear me through fire and earth, a bogey will not scare me. I am the sword of spring, I am the truth, old knight put out your stars, the dawn is here the sleepers wakening, and the wings of youth. With crumbling veneration and cowed fear, I make no truce. My loved one, live and dear, waits for me. Let me in. I fled the city. Shall I fear you, or, mother, ah, for pity? For his high mood fell shattered, like a man unnerved in bayonet fighting in the thick, full of red rum and cheers when he began, now in a dream muttering, I've not the trick. It's no good, I'm no good, they're all too quick. There, look there, look at that. So Dimer stood, suddenly drained of hope. It was no good. He pleaded then, shame beneath shame. Forgive, it may be there are powers I cannot break. If you are of them, speak. Speak, let me live. I ask so small a thing, I beg. I make my body a living prayer whose force would shake the mountains. I'll recant, confess my sin, but this once let me pass. I must go in. Yield but one inch, once only from your law. Set any price, I will give all, obey, all else but this. Hold your least word in awe, give you no cause for anger from this day. Answer, the least things living when they pray, as I pray now, bear witness. They speak true against God. Answer, mother, let me through. Then when he heard no answer, mad with fear, and with desire, too strained with both to know what he desired or feared, yet staggering near, he forced himself towards her and bent low for grappling. Then came darkness, then a blow fell on his heart, he thought. There came a blank of all things. As the dead sink, down he sank. The first big drops are rattling on the trees. The sky is copper dark, low thunder peeling. See Dimer with drooped head and knocking knees, comes from the porch. Then slowly, drunkly reeling, blind, beaten, broken, past desire of healing, past knowledge of his misery, he goes on, under the first dark trees, and now is gone. Canto Four First came the peal that split the heavens apart, straight overhead, then silence, then the rain. Twelve miles of downward water like one dart, and in one leap were launched along the plain, to break the budding flower and flood the grain, and keep with dripping sound an undersong, amid the wheeling thunder all night long. He put his hands before his face, he stooped, blind with his hair, the loud drop's grim tattoo beat him to earth, like summer grass he drooped, 
amazed, while sheeted lightning large and blue, blinked wide and pricked the quivering eyeball through. Then scrambling to his feet, with downward head, he fought into the tempest, as chance led. The wood was mad, suffing of branch and straining was there, drumming of water, light was none, nor knowledge of himself. The trees complaining, and his own throbbing heart seemed mixed in one, one sense of bitter loss and beauty undone. All else was blur and chaos and rain steam, and noise and the confusion of a dream. Aha! Earth hates a miserable man. Against him even the clouds and winds conspire. Heaven's voice smote Dimer's eardrum as he ran. Its red throat plagued the dark with corded fire. Barbed flame, coiled flame that ran like living wire. Charged with disastrous current left and right. About his path, hell blue or staring white. Stab, stab, blast all at once. What's he to fear? Look there, that cedar shriveling in swift blight, even where he stood. And there, ah, that came near. Oh, if some shaft would break his soul outright. What ease so to unload and scatter quite on the darkness this wild beating in his skull, too burning to endure, too tense and full. All lost and driven away, even her name unknown. O oh, fool to have wasted for a kiss, time when they could have talked, an angry shame was in him. He had worshipped earth, and this, the venomed clouds, fire spitting from the abyss, this was the truth indeed, the world's intent, Unmasked and naked now, the thing it meant. The storm lay on the forest a great time, Wheeled in its thundery circuit, turned, returned. Still through the dead-leaved darkness, through the slime Of standing pools and slots of clay storm-churned, Went Dimer. Still the knotty lightning burned along black air. He heard the unbroken sound of water rising in the hollower ground. He cursed it in his madness, flung it back, sorrow as wild as young men's sorrows are, till after midnight, when the tempest's track drew off between two clouds, appeared one star. Then his mood changed, and this was heavier far, when bit by bit, rarer and still more rare, the weakening thunder ceased from the cleansed air. When leaves began to drip with dying rain, and trees showed black against the glimmering sky, when the night birds flapped out and called again above him, when the silence cool and shy came stealing to its own and streams ran by, now audible amid the rustling wood. Oh, then came the worst hour for flesh and blood. It was no nightmare now with fiery stream, too horrible to last, able to blend itself and all things in one hurrying dream. It was the waking world that will not end because hearts break, that is not foe nor friend, where sane and settled knowledge first appears of work-day desolation with no tears. He halted then, footsore, weary to death, and heard his heart beating in solitude, when suddenly the sound of sharpest breath, indrawn with pain and the raw smell of blood, surprised his sense. Nearby to where he stood, came a long whimpering moan, a broken word, a rustle of leaves where some live body stirred. He groped towards the sound. What, brother, brother, who groaned? I'm hit, I'm finished, let me be. Put out your hand, then, reach me, no, the other. Don't touch, fool, damn you, leave me. I can't see, where are you? Then more groans, they've done for me. I've no hands, don't come near me. No, but stay. Don't leave me. Oh, my God. Is it near day? Soon now, a little longer. Can you sleep? I'll watch for you. Sleep, is it? That's ahead. But none till then. Listen, I've bled too deep. To last out till the morning, I'll be dead. Within the hour. Sleep then. I've heard it said. They don't mind at the last. But this is hell. If I'd the strength... I have such things to tell. All trembling in the dark and sweated over, like a man reared in peace, unused to pain, sat Dimer near him in the lightless cover, afraid to touch, 
and shame-faced to refrain. Then bit by bit, and often checked again, with agony the voice told on, the place was dark that neither saw the other's face. There is a city which men call in scorn the perfect city, eastward of this wood. You've heard about the place. There I was born. I'm one of them, their work. Their sober mood, the ordered life, the laws, are in my blood. A life, well, less than happy, something more than the red greed and lusts that went before. All in one day, one man, and at one blow, brought ruin on us all. There was a boy. Blue eyes, large limbs, were all he had to show. You need no greater profits to destroy. He seemed a man asleep. Sorrow and joy had passed him by. The dreamiest, safest man, the most obscure, until this curse began. Then, how or why it was, I cannot say. This dimer, this fool baby pink and white, went mad beneath his quiet face. One day, with nothing said, he rose and laughed outright before his master. Then, in all our sight, even where we sat to watch, he struck him dead, and screamed with laughter once again, and fled. Lord, how it all comes back, how still the place is, and he there, lying dead, only the sound of a blue-bottle buzzing, sharpened faces, strained, gaping from the benches all around, the dead man hunched and quiet with no wound, and minute after minute terror creeping with dreadful hopes to set the wild heart leaping. Then, one by one, at random, no word spoken, we slipped out to the sunlight and away. We felt the empty sense of something broken and comfortless adventure all that day. Men loitered at their work and could not say what trembled at their lips or what new light was in girls' eyes, yet we endured till night. Then I was lying wide awake in bed, shot through with tremulous thought, lame hopes and sweet desire of reckless days, with burning head. And then there came a clamor from the street, came nearer, 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 stamping feet, and screaming song and curses and a shout of, Who's for Dimer? Dimer! Up and out! We looked out from our window. Thronging there, a thousand of our people, girls and men, raved and reviled and shouted by the glare of torches and of bonfire blaze, and then came tumult from the street beyond. Again, Dimer, they cried, and farther off there came the sound of gunfire and the gleam of flame. I rushed down with the rest. Oh, we were mad. After this, it's all nightmare. The black sky, between the housetops framed, was all we had to tell us that the old world could not die, and that we were no gods. The flood ran high, when first I came, but after was the worse. Oh, to recall! On Dimer rest the curse! Our leader was a hunchback with red hair. Bran was his name. He had that kind of force about him that will hold your eyes fast there as in ten miles of green one patch of gorse will hold them. Do you know? His lips were coarse, but his eyes like a prophet's seemed to fill the whole face, and his tongue was never still. He cried, as Dimer broke, we'll break the chain. The world is free. They taught you to be chaste, and labor and bear orders and refrain. Refrain? From what? All's good enough. We'll taste whatever is. Life murmurs from the waste, beneath the mind. Who made the reasoning part, the jailer of the wild gods in the heart? We were a ragtail crew, wild-haired, half-dressed, all shouting, up for Dimer, up away. Yet each one always watching all the rest, and looking to his back. And some were gay, like drunk men, some were cringing, pinched and gray, with terror dry on the lip. The older ones had had the sense enough to bring their guns. The wave where I was swallowed swelled and broke after long surge into the open square. And here there was more light, new clamor woke. Here first I heard the bullets sting the air and went hot round the heart. Our lords were there in barricade with all their loyal men. 
For every one man loyal, Bran led ten. Then charge and cheer and bubbling sobs of death, We hovered on their front, Like swarming bees their spraying bullets came, No time for breath. I saw men's stomachs fall out on their knees, And shouting faces while they shouted freeze Into black bony masks, Before we knew we're into them. Swine, die then, that's for you. The next that I remember was a lull and sated pause. I saw an old, old man lying before my feet with shattered skull, and both my arms dripped red. And then came Bran, and at his heels a hundred murderers ran, with prisoners now, clamoring to take and try them, and burn them, wedge their nails up, crucify them. God! Once the lying spirit of a cause with maddening words dethrones the mind of men, they're past the reach of prayer. The eternal laws hate them. Their eyes will not come clean again, but doom and strong delusion drive them then, without ruth, without rest. The iron laughter of the immortal mouths goes hooting after. And we had firebrands, too. Tower after tower fell sheathed in thundering flame. The street was like a furnace mouth. We had them in our power. Then was the time to mock them and to strike, to flay men and spit women on the pike, bidding them dance. Wherever the most shame was done, the doer called on Dimer's name. Faces of men in torture, from my mind they will not go away. The east lay still in darkness when we left the town behind, flaming to light the fields. We'd had our will. We sang, Ho, oh, we will make the frost distill from time's gray forehead into living dew, and break whatever has been and build new. Day found us on the border of this wood, blear eyed and pale. Then the most part began to murmur and to lag, crying for food and shelter. But we dared not answer Bran. Wherever in the ranks the murmur ran, he'd find it. You there whispering, up you, sneak, reactionary, eh? Come out and speak. Then there'd be shrieks, a pistol shot, a cry, and someone down. I was the third he caught. The others pushed me out beneath his eye, saying, He's here, here, Captain. Who'd have thought, my old friends? But I know now, I've been taught. They cut away my two hands and my feet, and laughed and left me for the birds to eat. Oh, God's name! If I had my hands again, and Dimer here, it would not be my blood. I am stronger now than he is, old with pain. One grip would make him mine. But it's no good. I'm dying fast. Look, stranger, where the wood grows lighter. It's the morning. Stranger, dear, don't leave me. Talk a little while. Come near. But Dimer... Sitting hunched with knee to chin, close to the dying man, answered no word. His face was stone, there was no meaning in his wakeful eyes. Sometimes the other stirred, and fretted near his death. And Dimer heard, yet sat like one that neither hears nor sees, and the cold east whitened beyond the trees. Canto five. Through bearded cliffs a valley has driven thus deep, its wedge into the mountain and no more the faint track of the farthest wandering sheep ends here and the grey hollows at their core of silence feel the dulled continuous roar of higher streams at every step the skies grow less and in their place black ridges rise hither long after noon with plodding tread and eyes on earth grown dogged dimer came who all the long day in the woods had fled from the horror of those lips that screamed his name and cursed him busy wonder and keen shame were driving him and little thoughts like bees followed and pricked him on and left no ease now when he looked and saw this emptiness seven times enfolded in the idle hills there came a chilly pause to his distress a cloud of the deep world despair that fills a man's heart like the incoming tide and kills all pains except its own in that broad sea 
no hope, no change, and no regret can be. He felt the eternal strength of the silly earth, the unhastening circuit of the stars and sea, the business of perpetual death and birth, the meaningless precision, all must be, the same and still the same in each degree. Who cared now? And he smiled and could forgive, believing that for sure he would not live. Then, where he saw a little water run, beneath a bush he slept. The chills of May came dropping, and the stars peered one by one, out of the deepening blue, while far away, the western brightness dulled to bars of grey. Halfway to midnight, suddenly, from dreaming, he woke wide into present horror, screaming. For he had dreamt of being in the arms of his beloved and in quiet places, but all at once it filled with night alarms and rapping guns, and men with splintered faces, no eyes, no nose, all red, were running races with worms along the floor, and he ran out to find the girl and shouted, and that shout had carried him into the waking world. There stood the concave, vast, unfriendly night, and over him the scroll of stars unfurled. Then wailing like a child he rose upright, heart-sick with desolation. The new blight of loss had nipped him sore, and sad self-pity thinking of her, then thinking of the city. For in each moment's thought the deeds of Bran, the burning and the blood and his own shame, would tease him into madness till he ran for refuge to the thought of her, whence came utter and endless loss. No, not a name, not a word, nothing left, himself alone, crying amid that valley of old stone. How soon it all ran out! And I suppose, they, they up there, the old contriving powers, they knew it all the time, for someone knows, and waits and watches till we pluck the flowers then leaps so soon my store of happy hours all gone before i knew i have expended my whole wealth in a day it's finished ended and nothing left can it be possible that joy flows through and when the course is run it leaves no change no mark on us to tell it's passing and as poor as we've begun we end the richest day what we have won can it all die like this joy flickers on the razor edge of the present and is gone what have i done to bear upon my name the curse of bran i was not of his crew nor any man's and dimer has the blame what have i done wronged whom i never knew what's bran to me i had my deed to do and ran out by myself alone and free why should earth sing with joy and not for me Ah, but the earth never did sing for joy. There is a glamour on the leaf and flower, and April comes and whistles to a boy over white fields, and beauty has such power upon us, he believes her in that hour. For who could not believe? Can it be false, all that the blackbird says and the wind calls? What have I done? No living thing I made, nor wished to suffer harm. I sought my good, because the spring was gloriously arrayed, and the blue eye-bright misted all the wood. Yet to obey that springtime in my blood, this was to be unarmed and off my guard, and gave God time to hit once and hit hard. The men build right who made that city of ours. They knew their world. A man must crouch to face infinite malice, watching at all hours. Shut nature out, give her no moment's space, for entry. The first needs of all our race are walls, a den, a cover. Traitor I, who first ran out beneath the open sky. Our fortress and fenced place I made to fall. I slipped the sentries and let in the foe. I have lost my brothers and my love and all. Nothing is left but me. Now let me go. I have seen the world stripped naked, and I know. Great God, take back your world. I will have none of all your glittering gods but death alone. Meanwhile the earth swung round in hollow night. Souls without number in all nations slept, snug on her back, safe speeding towards the light. Hours told, and in damp woods the night beast crept, and over the long seas the watch was kept, in black ships twinkling onward, 
green and red, always the ordered stars moved overhead. And no one knew that Dimer in his scales had weighed all these and found them nothing worth. Indifferently the dawn that never fails troubled the east of night with gradual birth, whispering a change of colors on cold earth, and a bird woke, then too, the sunlight ran along the hills and yellow day began. But stagnant gloom clung in the valley yet. Hills crowded out a third part of the sky, black-looking, and the boulders dripped with wet. No birds sang. Dimer, shivering, heaved a sigh, and yawned and said, It's cruel work to die of hunger, and again with cloudy breath, blown between chattering teeth, it's a bad death. He crouched and clasped his hands about his knees, and hugged his own limbs for the pitiful sense of homeliness they had, familiars these, this body at least his own, his last defense. But soon his morning misery drove him thence, eating his heart to wander as chance led, on, upward, to the narrowing gully's head. The cloud lay on the nearest mountain top, as from a giant's chimney smoking there, but Dimer took no heed. Sometimes he'd stop, sometimes he hurried faster, as despair pricked deeper, and cried out, Even now, somewhere, Bran with his crews at work. They rack, they burn, and there's no help in me. I've served their turn. Meanwhile the furrowed fog rolled down ahead, long tatters of its vanguard smearing round the bases of the crags. Like cobweb shed, down the deep combs it dulled the tinkling sound of water on the hills. The spongy ground faded three yards ahead. Then nearer yet fell the cold wreaths, the white depth gleaming wet. Then after a long time the path he trod led downward. Then all suddenly it dipped, far steeper, and yet steeper with smooth sod. He was half running now. A stone that slipped beneath him rattled headlong down. He tripped, stumbled and clutched. Then panic and no hope to stop himself, once lost upon that slope. And faster, ever faster, and his eye caught treetops far below. The nightmare feeling had gripped him. He was screaming, and the sky seemed hanging upside down. Then struggling, reeling, with effort beyond thought, he hung half kneeling, halted one saving moment. With wild will, he clawed into the hillside and lay still. Half hanging on both arms, his idle feet dangled and found no hold. The moor lay wet against him, and he sweated with the heat of terror all alive. His teeth were set. By God, I will not die, said he, not yet. Then slowly, slowly, with enormous strain, he heaved himself an inch, then heaved again, till saved and spent he lay. He felt, indeed, it was the big round world beneath his breast, the mother planet proven at his need. The shame of glad surrender stood confessed. He cared not for his boasts. This, this was best. This giving up of all. He need not strive. He panted. He lay still. He was alive. And now his eyes were closed. Perhaps he slept lapped in unearthly quiet, never knew how bit by bit the fog's white rearguard crept over the crest and faded, and the blue, first brightening at the zenith, trembled through, and deepening shadows took a sharper form each moment, and the sandy earth grew warm. Yet dreaming of blue skies, in dream he heard the pure voice of a lark that seemed to send its song from heights beyond all height. That bird, saying out of heaven, the world will never end, saying from the gates of heaven, will never end, saying till it seemed there was no other thing but bright space and one voice set there to sing. It seemed to be the murmur and the voice of beings beyond number, each and all, singing I am, each of itself made choice, and was, whence flows the justice that men call divine. She keeps the great worlds lest they fall from hour to hour, and makes the hills renew their ancient youth and sweetens all things through. 
It seemed to be the low voice of the world, brooding alone beneath the strength of things, murmuring of days and nights and years unfurled, forever and the unwearied joy that brings out of old fields the flowers of unborn springs, out of old wars and cities burned with wrong, a splendor in the dark, a tale, a song. The dream ran thin towards waking, and he knew it was a bird's piping with no sense. He rolled round on his back, the sudden blue, quivering with light, hard, cloudless, and intense, shone over him, the lark still sounded thence, and stirred him at the heart. Some spacious thought was passing by too gently to be caught. With that he thrust the damp hair from his face and sat upright. The perilous cliff dropped sheer before him close at hand, and from his place, listening in mountain silence, he could hear birds crying far below. It was not fear that took him, but strange glory when his eye looked past the edge into surrounding sky. He rose and stood, then lo, the world beneath, wide pools that in the sun-splashed foothills lay, sheep-dotted downs, soft-piled, and rolling heath, river and shining weir, and steeples gray, and the green waves of forest. Far away, distance rose, heaped on distance. Nearer hand, the white roads, leading down to a new land. Canto Six. The sun was high in heaven, and Dimer stood, a bright speck on the endless mountainside, till blossom after blossom that rich mood faded and truth rolled homeward, like a tide before whose edge the weak soul fled to hide in vain, with ostrich head through many a shape of coward fancy, whimpering for escape. But only for a moment, then his soul took the full swell and heaved a dripping prow clear of the shattering wave-crest. He was whole. No veil should hide the truth, no truth should cow the dear self-pitying heart. I'll babble now no longer, Dimer said. I'm broken in. Pack up the dreams and let the life begin. With this he turned. I must have food today, he muttered. Then among the cloudless hills, by winding tracks he sought the downward way and followed the steep course of tumbling rills, came to the glens the wakening mountain fills, in springtime with the echoing splash and shock of waters leaping cold from rock to rock. And still it seemed that lark with its refrain sang in the sky and wind was in his hair and hope at heart. Then once, and once again, he heard a gun fired off. It broke the air as a stone breaks a pond, and everywhere... The dry crags echoed clear, and at the sound, once a big bird rose whirring from the ground. In half an hour he reached the level land, and followed the field paths and crossed the stiles, then looked and saw nearby on his left hand an old house folded round with billowy piles of dark yew hedge. The moss was on the tiles, the pigeons in the yard, and in the tower a clock that had no hands and told no hour. He hastened. In warm waves the garden scent came stronger at each stride. The mountain breeze was gone. He reached the gates, then in he went, and seemed to lose the sky. Such weight of trees hung overhead. He heard the noise of bees, and saw far off, in the blue shade between the windless elms, one walking on the green. It was a mighty man whose beardless face beneath gray hair shone out so large and mild it made a sort of moonlight in the place. A dreamy desperation, wistful wild, showed in his glance and gait, yet like a child, an Asian emperor's only child was he, with his grave looks and bright solemnity. And over him there hung the witching air, the willful courtesy of the days of old the graces wherein idleness grows fair, and somewhat in his sauntering walk he rolled and toyed about his waist with seals of gold, or stood to ponder often in mid-stride, tilting his heavy head upon one side. When Dimer had called twice, he turned his eye. 
then coming out of silence as a star all in one moment slips into the sky of evening yet we feel it comes from far he said sir you are welcome few there are that come my way and in huge hands he pressed dimer's cold hand and bade him in to rest how did you find this place out have you heard my gun it was but now i killed a lark what sir said dimer shoot the singing bird sir said the man they sing from dawn till dark and interrupt my dreams too long but hark another did you hear no singing no it was my fancy then pray let it go from here you see my garden's only flaw stand here sir at the dial dimer stood the master pointed then he looked and saw how hedges and the funeral quietude of black trees fringe the garden like a wood and only in one place one gap that showed the blue side of the hills the white hill road i have planted fir and larch to fill the gap he said because this too makes war upon the art of dream but by some great mishap nothing i plant will grow there we pass on the sunshine of the afternoon is gone let us go in it draws near time to sup i hate the garden till the moon is up they passed from the hot lawn into the gloom and coolness of the porch then passed a door that opened with no noise into a room where green leaves choked the window and the floor sank lower than the ground a tattered store of brown books met the eye a crystal ball and masks with empty eyes along the wall then dimer sat but knew not how nor where and supper was set out before these two he saw not how with silver old and rare but tarnished and he ate and never knew what meats they were at every bite he grew more drowsy and let slide his crumbling will the master at his side was talking still and all his talk was tales of magic words and of the nations in the clouds above astral and airish tribes who fish for birds with angles and by history he could prove how chosen spirits from earth had won their love as arthur or usheen and to their isle went helen for the sake of a greek smile and ever in his talk he mustered well his texts and strewed old authors round the way thus wyrus writes and thus the hermetics tell this was agrippa's view and others say with cardan till he had stolen quite away dimer's dull wits and softly drawn apart the ivory gates of hope that change the heart dimer was talking now now dimer told of his own love and losing drowsily the master leaned towards him was it cold this spirit to the touch no sir not she said dimer and his host why this must be ethereal not aerial o oh, my soul be still but wait tell on sir tell the whole then dimer told him of the beldam too the old old matriarchal dreadfulness over the master's face a shadow drew he shifted in his chair and yes and yes he murmured twice i never looked for less always the same that frightful woman's shape besets the dreamway and the soul's escape but now when dimer made to talk of bran a huge indifference fell upon his host patient and wandering eyed then he began forgive me you are young what helps us most is to find out again that heavenly ghost who loves you for she was a ghost and you in that place where you met were ghostly too listen for i can launch you on the stream will roll you to the shores of her own land i could be sworn you never learn to dream but every night you take with careless hand what chance may bring i'll teach you to command the comings and the goings of your spirit through all that borderland which dreams inherit you shall have hauntings suddenly and often when you forget when least you think of her for so you shall forget a light will soften over the evening woods and in the stir of morning dreams oh i will teach you sir there'll come a sound of wings or you shall be waked in the midnight murmuring it was she no no said dimer not that way 
I seem to have slept for twenty years. Now, while I shake out of my eyes that dust of burdening dream, now when the long clouds tremble ripe to break, and the far hills appear, when first I wake, still blinking, struggling towards the world of men, and longing, would you turn me back again? Dreams? I have had my dream too long. I thought the sun rose for my sake. I ran down blind and dancing to the abyss. Oh, sir, I brought boy laughter for a gift to gods who find the martyr's soul too soft. But that's behind. I'm waking now. They broke me. All ends thus, always. And we are for them, not they for us. And she, she was no dream. It would be waste to seek her there, the living in that den of lies. The master smiled. You are in haste. For broken dreams the cure is, dream again, and deeper. If the waking world and men and nature marred your dream, so much the worse, for a crude world beneath its primal curse. Ah, but you do not know. Can dreams do this? Pluck out blood guiltiness upon the shore of memory, and undo what's amiss, and bid the thing that has been be no more? Sir, it is only dreams unlock that door, he answered with a shrug. What would you have? In dreams the thrice-proved coward can feel brave. In dreams the fool is free from scorning voices. Grey-headed whores are virgin there again. Out of the past dream brings long-buried choices. All in a moment snaps the tenfold chain that life took years in forging. There the stain of oldest sins, how do the good words go? Though they were scarlet, shall be white as snow. Then, drawing near, when Dimer did not speak, My little son, said he, your wrong and right are also dreams, fetters to bind the weak faster to phantom earth and blear the sight. Wake into dreams, into the larger light that quenches these frail stars. They will not know earth's bylaws in the land to which you go. I must undo my sins, an earthly law and even in earth the child of yesterday. Throw down your human pity. Cast your awe behind you. Put repentance all away. Home to the elder depths, for never they supped with the stars who dared not slough behind the last shred of earth's holies from their mind. Sir, answered Dimer, I would be content to drudge in earth, easing my heart's disgrace, counting a year's long service lightly spent, if once at the year's end I saw her face, somewhere, being then most weary, in some place I looked not for that joy, or heard her near, whispering, yet courage, friend, for one more year. Pish, said the master, will you have the truth? You think that virtue saves? Her people care for the high heart and idle hours of youth. For these they will descend our lower air, not virtue. You would nerve your arm and bear your burden among men? Look to it, child. By virtue's self, vision can be defiled. You will grow full of pity and the love of men, and toil until the morning moisture dries out of your heart. Then once or once again it may be you will find her, but your eyes soon will be grown too dim. The task that lies next to your hand will hide her. You shall be the child of earth and gods you shall not see. Here suddenly he ceased. Tiptoes he went. A bolt clicked, then the window creaked ajar, and out of the wet world the hedgerow scent came floating, and the dark without one star, nor shape of trees nor sense of near and far, the undimensioned night and formless skies were there, and were the master's great allies. I am very old, he said, but if the time we suffered in our dreams were counting age, I have outlived the ocean, and my prime is with me to this day. Years cannot gauge the dream life. In the turning of a page, dozing above my book, I have lived through more ages than the lost Lemuria knew. I am not mortal. Were I doomed to die this hour, in this half-hour I interpose a thousand years of dream and those gone by, as many more, and in the last of those, ten thousand, 
ever journeying towards a close that I shall never reach, for time shall flow, wheel within wheel, interminably slow. And you will drink my cup and go your way into the valley of dreams. You have heard the call. Come hither and escape. Why should you stay? Earth is a sinking ship, a house whose wall is tottering while you sweep. The roof will fall before the work is done. You cannot mend it. Patch as you will, at last the rot must end it. Then Dimer lifted up his heavy head, like Atlas on broad shoulders bearing up the insufferable globe. I had not said, he mumbled, never said I'd taste the cup. What, is it this you give me? Must I sup? Oh, lies, all lies. Why did you kill the lark? Guide me the cup to lip. It is so dark. Canto Seven. The host had trimmed his lamp, the downy moth, came from the garden, where the lamplight shed its circle of smooth white upon the cloth, down mid the rinds of fruit and broken bread, upon his sprawling arms lay Dimer's head, and often as he dreamed he shifted place, muttering and showing half his drunken face. The beating stillness of the dead of night flooded the room, the dark and sleepy powers settled upon the house and filled it quite. Far from the roads it lay, from belfry towers, and hen-roosts in a world of folded flowers, buried in loneliest fields where beasts that love the silence through the unrustled hedgerows move. Now from the master's lips there breathed a sigh, as of a man released from some control that wronged him, without aim his wandering eye, unsteadied and unfixed, began to roll. His lower lip dropped loose. The informing soul seemed fading from his face. He laughed out loud, once only, then looked round him, hushed and cowed. Then summoning all himself, with tightened lip, with desperate coolness and attentive air, he touched between his thumb and fingertip, each in its turn, the four legs of his chair. Then back again in haste, there, that one there, had been forgotten. Once more, safer now. That's better. And he smiled and cleared his brow. Yet this was but a moment's ease. Once more he glanced about him like a startled hare, his big eyes bulged with horror, as before, quick to the touch that saves him. But despair is nearer by one step, and in his chair, huddling, he waits. He knows that they'll come strong, again and yet again and all night long and after this night comes another night night after night until the worst of all and now too even the noonday and the light let through the horrors oh could he recall the deep sleep and the dreams that used to fall around him for the asking but somehow something's amiss sleep comes so rarely now then, like the dog returning to its vomit, he staggered to the bookcase to renew yet once again the taint he had taken from it, and shuddered as he went, but horror drew his feet, as joy draws others. There in view was his strange heaven, and his far stranger hell, his secret lust, his soul's dark citadel. Old Theogmagia, Demonology, Kabbalah, Chemic Magic, Book of the Dead, Damning hermetic rolls that none may see, save the already damned. Such gruels are bred from minds that lose the spirit and seek instead for spirits in the dust of dead men's error, buying the joys of dream with dreamland terror. This lost soul looked them over one and all, now sickened at the heart's root, for he knew this night was one of those when he would fall and scream alone. Such things they made him do, and roll upon the floor. The madness grew, wild at his breast, but still his brain was clear that he could watch the moment coming near. But ere it came, he heard a sound, half groan, half muttering from the table. Like a child, caught unawares that thought it was alone, he started as in guilt, 
His gaze was wild, yet pitiably with all his will he smiled. So strong is shame, even then. And Dimer stirred, now waking, and looked up and spoke one word. Water, he said. He was too dazed to see what hell-wrung face looked down, what shaking hand poured out the draught. He drank it thirstily, and held the glass for more. Your land, your land, of dreams, he said, all lies. I understand more than I did. Yes, water, I've the thirst of hell itself. Your magic's all accursed. When he had drunk again, he rose and stood, pallid and cold with sleep. By God, he said, you did me wrong to send me to that wood. I sought a living spirit and found instead bogies and wraiths. The master raised his head calm as a sage, and answered, Are you mad? Come, sit you down. Tell me what dream you had. I dreamed about a wood, an autumn red, of beech trees big as mountains. Down between, the first thing that I saw, a clearing spread. Deep down, oh, very deep, like some ravine, or like a well it sank, that forest green, under its weight of forest, more remote than one ship in a landlocked sea afloat. Then through the narrowed sky some heavy bird would flap its way, a stillness more profound, following its languid wings. Sometimes I heard, far off in the long woods with quiet sound, the sudden chestnut thumping to the ground, or the dry leaf that drifted past upon its endless loiter earthward and was gone. Then next I heard twigs splintering on my right and rustling in the thickets. Turning there, I watched. Out of the foliage came in sight the head and blundering shoulders of a bear, glistening in sable black, with beady stare of eyes towards me, and no room to fly, but padding soft and slow, the beast came by. And, mark their flattery, stood and rubbed his flank against me, on my shaken legs I felt his heart beat, and my hand that stroked him sank, wrist deep upon his shoulder in soft pelt. Yes, and across my spirit as I smelt the wild thing's scent, a new sweet wildness ran, whispering of Eden fields, long lost by man. So far was well, but then came emerald birds singing about my head. I took my way, sauntering the cloistered woods. Then came the herds, the roebuck and the fallow deer at play, trooping to nose my hand. All this, you say, was sweet? Oh, sweet, do you think I could not see that beasts and wood were nothing else but me? That I was making everything I saw, too sweet, far too well fitted to desire to be a living thing? Those forests draw no sap from the kind earth, the solar fire and soft rain feed them not. That fairy briar pricks not. The birds sing sweetly in that brake, not for their own delight, but for my sake. It is a world of sad, cold, heartless stuff, like a bought smile, no joy in it. But stay, did you not find your lady? Sure enough, I still had hopes till then. The autumn day was westering, the long shadows crossed my way, when over daisies folded for the night, beneath rook-gathering elms, she came in sight. Was she not fair? So beautiful she seemed almost a living soul, but every part was what I made it. All that I had dreamed, no more, no less. The mirror of my heart, such things as boyhood feigns beneath the smart of solitude and spring. I was deceived, almost. In that first moment, I believed. For a big brooding rapture, tense as fire, and calm as a first sleep, had soaked me through. Without thought, without word, without desire. Meanwhile, above our heads the deepening blue burnished the gathering stars. Her sweetness drew a veil before my eyes. The minutes passed, heavy like loaded vines. She spoke at last. She said, For this land only did men love the shadow lands of earth. All our disease of longing, all the hopes we fabled of, Fortunate islands or Hesperian seas, or woods beyond the west, were but the breeze that blew from off those shores. 
one far-spent breath that reached even to the world of change and death. She told me I had journeyed home at last, into the golden age and the good country that had been always there. She bade me cast my cares behind forever. On her knee worshipped me, Lord and love. Oh, I can see her red lips even now. Is it not wrong that men's delusions should be made so strong? For listen, I was so besotted now. She made me think that I was somehow seeing the very core of truth. I felt somehow, beyond all veils, the inward pulse of being. Thought was enslaved, but, oh, it felt like freeing and draughts of larger air. It is too much. Who can come through untainted from that touch? There I was nearly wrecked, but mark the rest. She went too fast. Soft to my arms she came. The robe slipped from her shoulder. The smooth breast was bare against my own. She shone like flame before me in the dusk. All love, all shame. Faugh! And it was myself. But all was well. For at the least, that moment snapped the spell. As when you light a candle, the great gloom, which was the unbounded night, sinks down, compressed, to four white walls in one familiar room. So the vague joy shrank wilted in my breast, and narrowed to one point, unmasked, confessed. Fool's paradise was gone. Instead was there King Lust with his black, sudden, serious stare. That moment, in a cloud among the trees, wild music and the glare of torches came. On sweated faces, on the prancing knees of shaggy satyrs, fell the smoky flame. On ape and goat and crawlers without name. On rolling breast, black eyes and tossing hair. On old, bald-headed witches, lean and bare. They beat the devilish tom-tom rub-a-dub, lunging, leaping, in unwieldy romp. Singing Cotito and Beelzebub, with devil dancers mask and phallic pomp, torn raw with briars and caked from many a swamp, they came, among the wild flowers dripping blood, and churning the green mosses into mud. They sang, Return, return, we are the lust that was before the world and still shall be, when your last law is trampled into dust. We are the mother swamp, the primal sea, whence the dry land appeared. Old, old are we. It is but a return. It's nothing new. Easy as slipping on a well-worn shoe. And then there came warm mouths and fingertips, Praying upon me whence I could not see. Then a huge face, low-browed with swollen lips, Crooning, I am not beautiful as she, But I'm the older love. You shall love me far more than beauty's self. You have been ours always. We are the world's most ancient powers. First flatterer, and then bogey, like a dream. Sir, are you listening? Do you also know how close to the soft laughter comes the scream down yonder? But his host cried sharply, No, leave me alone. Why will you plague me? Go, out of my house, be gone. With all my heart, said Dimer, but one word before we part. He paused, and in his cheek the anger burned. Then, turning to the table, he poured out more water. But before he drank, he turned, then leaped back to the window with a shout, for there it was no dream, beyond all doubt. He saw the master crouch with leveled gun, cackling in maniac voice, Run, Dimer, run! He ducked and sprang far out. The starless night on the wet lawn closed round him every way. Then came the gun crack, and the splash of light vanished as soon as seen. Cool garden clay slid from his feet. He had fallen, and he lay, face downward among leaves, then up and on, through branch and leaf, till sense and breath were gone. Canto Eight. When next he found himself, no house was there, no garden and great trees. Beside a lane, in grass he lay, now first he was aware that all one side his body glowed with pain, and the next moment, and the next again, was neither less nor more, 
Without a pause, it clung like a great beast with fastened claws. That for a time he could not frame a thought, nor know himself for self, nor pain for pain, till moment added on to moment taught the new, strange art of living on that plain. Taught how the grappled soul must still remain, still choose and think and understand beneath the very grinding of the ogre's teeth. He heard the wind along the hedges sweep, the quarter striking from a neighboring tower. About him was the weight of the world's sleep, within the thundering pain. That quiet hour heeded it not. It throbbed, it raged with power, fit to convulse the heavens, and at his side the soft peace drenched the meadows far and wide. The air was cold, the earth was cold with dew, the hedge behind him dark as ink, but now the clouds broke and a paler heaven showed through, spacious with sudden stars, breathing somehow, the sense of change to slumbering lands, a cow coughed in the fields behind, the puddles showed like pools of sky amid the darker road. And he could see his own limbs faintly white, and the blood black upon them, then by chance he turned, and it was strange, there at his right he saw a woman standing, and her glance met his, and at the meeting his deep trance changed not, and while he looked the knowledge grew, she was not of the old life, but the new. Who is it? he said. The loved one, the long lost. He stared upon her. Truly? Truly indeed. O oh, lady, you come late. I am tempest-tossed, broken and wrecked. I am dying. Look, I bleed. Why have you left me thus and given no heed to all my prayers, left me to be the game of all deceits? You should have asked my name. What are you, then? But to his sudden cry she did not answer. When he had thought a while, he said, How can I tell it is no lie? It may be one more phantom to beguile the brain-sick dreamer with its harlot smile. I have not smiled, she said. The neighboring bell tolled out another quarter. Silence fell. And after a long pause he spoke again. Leave me, he said. Why do you watch with me? You do not love me. Human tears and pain, and hoping for the things that cannot be, and blundering in the night where none can see, and courage with cold back against the wall, you do not understand. I know them all. The gods themselves know pain, the eternal forms. In realms beyond the reach of cloud, and skies nearest the ends of air, where come no storms, nor sound of earth, I have looked into their eyes. Peaceful and filled with pain beyond surmise, filled with an ancient woe man cannot reach, one moment though in fire, yet calm their speech. Then these, said Dimer, were the world I wooed, these were the holiness of flowers and grass and desolate dews, these the eternal mood, blowing the eternal theme through men that pass. I called myself their lover, I that was, less fit for that long service than the least dull workday drudge of men or faithful beast. Why do they lure to them such spirits as mine, the weak, the passionate, and the fool of dreams, when better men go safe and never pine, with whisperings at the heart, soul-sickening gleams of infinite desire, and joy that seems the promise of full power? For it was they, the gods themselves, that led me on this way. Give me the truth, I ask not now for pity. When gods call, can the following them be sin? Was it false light that lured me from the city? Where was the path, without it or within? Must it be one blind throw to lose or win? Has heaven no voice to help? Must things of dust guess their own way in the dark? She said, they must. Another silence, then he cried in wrath. You came in human shape. In sweet disguise, wooing me, lurking for me in my path, hid your eternal cold with woman's eyes, snared me with shows of love, and all was lies. She answered, For our kind must come to all, if bidden, but in the shape for which they call. 
What, answered Dimer, do you change and sway to serve us as the obedient planets spin about the sun? Are you but potter's clay for us to mold, unholy to our sin, and holy to the holiness within? She said, Waves fall on many an unclean shore, yet the salt seas are holy as before. Our nature is no purer for the saint that worships, nor from him that uses ill our beauty can we suffer any taint. As from the first we were, so are we still. With incorruptibles the mortal will corrupts itself, and clouded eyes will make darkness within from beams they cannot take. Well, it is well, said Dimer, if I have used the embreathing spirit amiss, what would have been the strength of all my days I have refused, and plucked the stalk too hasty in the green, trusted the good for best, and having seen half beauty or beauty's fringe, the lowest stair, the common incantation worshipped there. But presently he cried in his great pain, If I had loved a beast it would repay, but I have loved the spirit and loved in vain. Now let me die. Ah! but before the way is ended quite, in the last hour of day, is there no word of comfort, no one kiss of human love? Does it all end in this? She answered, Never ask of life and death. Uttering these names, you dream of wormy clay, or of surviving ghosts. This withering breath of words is the beginning of decay, in truth, when truth grows cold and pines away. Among the ancestral images, your eyes first see her dead, and more the more she dies. You are still dreaming, dreams you shall forget, when you have cast your fetters far from here. Go forth, the journey is not ended yet. You have seen Dimer dead and on the bier, more often than you dream, and dropped no tear. You have slain him every hour. Think not at all of death lest into death by thought you fall. He turned to question her, then looked again, and lo, the shape was gone. The darkness lay, heavy as yet, and a cold, shifting rain fell with the breeze that springs before the day. It was an hour death loves. Across the way, the clock struck once again. He saw nearby the black shape of the tower against the sky. Meanwhile, above the torture and the riot of leaping pulse and nerve that shot with pain, somewhere aloof and poised in spectral quiet, his soul was thinking on. The dizzied brain scarce seemed her organ. Link by link the chain that bound him to the flesh was loosening fast, and the new life breathed in, unmoved and vast. It was like this, he thought like this or worse, for him that I found bleeding in the wood. Blessings upon him. There I learned the curse that rests on Dimer's name, and truth was good. He has forgotten now the fire and blood. He has forgotten that there was a man called Dimer. He knows not himself nor Bran. How long have I been moved at heart in vain about this Dimer, thinking this was I? Why did I follow close his joy and pain, more than another man's? For he will die, the little cloud will vanish, and the sky reigns as before. The stars remain, and earth, and man, as in the years before my birth. There was a dimer once, who worked and played about the city. I sloughed him off and ran. There was a dimer in the forest glade, ranting alone, skulking the fates of man. I cast him also, and a third began, and he too died, but I am none of those. Is there another still to die? Who knows? Then in his pain, half wondering what he did, he made to struggle towards that belfried place, and groaning down the sodden bank he slid, and groaning in the lane he felt his trace of bloodied mire, then halted with his face upwards towards the gateway, breathing hard. An old lichgate before a burial yard. He looked within, between the huddling crosses, over the slanted tombs and sunken slate, spread the deep quiet grass and humble mosses, a green and growing darkness, drenched of late, 
smelling of earth and damp. He reached the gate with failing hand. I will rest here, he said, and the long grass will cool my burning head. Canto 9 Even as he heard the wicket clash behind, came a great wind beneath that seemed to tear the solid graves apart, and deaf and blind whirled him upright like smoke through towering air, whose levels were as steps of a sky stair. The parching cold roughened his throat with thirst, and pricked him at the heart. This was the first. And as he soared into the next degree, suddenly all around him he could hear sad strings that fretted inconsolably, and ominous horns that blew both far and near. There broke his human heart, and his last tear froze scalding on his chin. But while he heard, he shot like a sped dart into the third. And its first stroke of silence could destroy the spring of tears forever, and compress from off his lips the curved bow of the boy forever. The sidereal loneliness received him, where no journeying leaves the less still to be journeyed through, but everywhere, fast though you fly, the center still is there. And here the well-worn fabric of our life fell from him, hope and purpose were cut short, even the blind trust that reaches in mid-strife towards some heart of things, here blew the mort for the world spirit herself, the last support was fallen away, himself one spark of soul, swam in unbroken void, he was the whole. And wailing, why hast thou forsaken me? Was there no world at all but only I, dreaming of gods and men? Then suddenly he felt the wind no more, he seemed to fly, faster than light but free, and scaled the sky in his own strength, as if a falling stone should wake to find the world's will was its own. And on the instant, straight before his eyes, he looked and saw a sentry shape that stood, leaning upon its spear, with hurrying skies behind it, and a moonset red as blood. Upon its head were helmet and mailed hood, and shield upon its arm and sword at thigh, all black and pointed sharp against the sky. Then came the clink of metal, the dry sound of steel on rock, and challenge, Who comes here? And as he heard it, Dimer at one bound stood in the stranger's shadow with the spear between them, and his human face came near that larger face. What watch is this you keep? said Dimer, on the edge of such a deep. And answer came, I watch both night and day this frontier. There are beasts of the upper air as beasts of the deep sea. One walks this way, night after night, far scouring from his lair, chewing the cud of lusts which are despair, and fill not while his mouth gapes dry for bliss that never was. What kind of beast is this? A kind of things escaped that have no home, hunters of men. They love the spring uncurled, the will worn down, the wearied hour. They come at night-time when the mask is off the world, and the soul's gate ill-locked and the flag furled. Then softly, a pale swarm, and in disguise, flit past the drowsy watchman, small as flies. I'll see this airish beast whereof you speak. I'll share the watch with you. Nay, little one, be gone. You are of earth, the flesh is weak. What is the flesh to me? My course is run, all but some deed still waiting to be done. Some moment I may rise on as the boat lifts with the lifting tide and steals afloat. You are a spirit, and it is well with you, but I am come out of great folly and shame, the sack of cities, wrongs I must undo. But tell me of the beast, and whence it came. Who were its sire and dam? What is its name? It is my kin. All monsters are the brood of heaven and earth, and mixed with holy blood. How can this be? My son, sit here a while. There is a lady in that primal place where I was born, who with her ancient smile made glad the sons of heaven. She loved to chase the springtime round the world. To all your race, she was a sudden quivering in the wood, 
or a new thought springing in solitude. Till in prodigious hour one swollen with youth, blind from new broken prison, knowing not himself nor her nor how to mate with truth, lay with her in a strange and secret spot, mortal with her immortal, and begot this walker in the night. But did you know this mortal's name? Why, it was long ago. And yet I think I bear the name in mind. It was some famished boy whom tampering men had crippled in their chains and made him blind, till their weak hour discovered them, and then he broke that prison. Softly, it comes again. I have it. It was Dimer, little one. Dimer's the name. This spectre is his son. Then after silence came an answering shout from Dimer, glad and full. Break off, dismiss. Your watch is ended, and your lamp is out. Unarm, unarm, return into your bliss. You are relieved, sir. I must deal with this, as in my right. For either I must slay this beast, or else be slain before the day. So mortal and so brave, that other said, smiling, and turned and looked in Dimer's eyes, scanning him over twice from heel to head, like an old sergeant's glance grown battle-wise to know the points of men. At last, arise, he said, and wear my arms. I can withhold nothing, for such an hour has been foretold. Thereat, with lips as cold as the sea surge, he kissed the youth, and bending on one knee, put all his armor off, and let emerge angelic shoulders marbled gloriously, and feet like frozen speed, and plain to see, on his wide breast dark wounds and ancient scars, the battle honors of celestial wars. Then like a squire or brother born he dressed the young man in those plates that dripped with cold upon the inside, trickling over breast and shoulder but without the figured gold gave to the tinkling ice its jagged hold, and the icy spear froze fast to Dimer's hand, but where the other had stood he took his stand. And searched the cloudy landscape, he could see dim shapes like hills appearing, but the moon had sunk behind their backs. When will it be, said Dimer, and the other, soon now, soon. For either he comes past us at night's noon, or else between the night and the full day, and down there on your left will be his way. Swear that you will not come between us two, nor help me by a hair's weight if I bow. If you are he, if prophecies speak true, not heaven and all the gods can help you now. This much I have been told, but know not how the fight will end. Who knows? I cannot tell. Sir, be content, said Dimer, I know well. Thus Dimer stood to arms, with eyes that ranged, through aching darkness, stared upon it so, that all things as he looked upon them changed, and were not as at first, but grave and slow, the larger shade went sauntering to and fro, humming at first the snatches of some tune that soldiers sing, but falling silent soon. Then came steps of dawn, and though they heard no milking cry in the fields, and no cock crew, and out of empty air no twittering bird sounded from neighboring hedges, yet they knew. Eastward the hollow blackness paled to blue, then blue to white, and in the west the rare surviving stars blinked feebler in cold air. Far beneath Dimer's feet the sad half-light, discovering the new landscape, oddly came, and forms grown half-familiar in the night looked strange again, no distance seemed the same. And now he could see clear and call by name, valleys and hills and woods, the phantoms all took shape and made a world at morning's call. It was a ruinous land. The ragged stumps of broken trees rose out of endless clay, naked of flower and grass, the slobbered humps dividing the dead pools. Against the grey a shattered village gaped, but now the day was very near them, and the night was past, and Dimer understood and spoke at last. Now I have wooed and won you, bridal earth, beautiful world that lives, desire of men. 
all that the spirit intended at my birth this day shall be born into deed and then the hard day's labor comes no more again forever the pain dies the longings cease the ship glides under the green arch of peace now drink me as the sun drinks up the mist this is the hour to cease in at full flood that asks no gift from following years but hist look yonder at the corner of that wood look look there where he comes it shocks the blood the first sight eh now sentinel stand clear and save yourself for god's sake come not near his full-grown spirit had moved without command or spur of the will before he knew he found that he was leaping forward spear in hand to where that ashen brute wheeled slowly round nosing and set its ears towards the sound the pale and heavy brute rough ridged behind and full of eyes clinking in scaly rind and now ten paces parted them and here he halted he thrust forward his left foot poising his straightened arms and launched the spear and gloriously it sang but now the brute lurched forward and he saw the weapon shoot beyond it and fall quivering on the field dimer drew out his sword and raised the shield what now my friends you get no more from me of dimer he goes from us what he felt or saw from henceforth no man knows but he who has himself gone through the jungle belt of dying into peace that angel knelt far off and watched them close but could not see their battle all was ended suddenly a leap a cry flurry of steel and claw then silence as before the morning light and the same brute crouched yonder and he saw under its feet broken and bent and white the ruined limbs of dimer killed outright all in a moment all his story done but that same moment came the rising sun and thirty miles to westward the gray cloud flushed into answering pink long shadows streamed from every hill and the low-hanging shroud of mist along the valleys broke and steamed gold flecked to heaven far off the armor gleamed like glass upon the dead man's back but now the sentinel ran forward hand to brow and staring for between him and the sun he saw that country clothed with dancing flowers where flower had never grown and one by one the splintered woods as if from april showers were softening into green in the leafy towers rose the cool sudden chattering on the tongues of happy birds with morning in their lungs the wave of flowers came breaking round his feet crocus and bluebell primrose daffodil shivering with moisture and the air grew sweet within his nostrils changing heart and will making him laugh he looked and dimer still lay dead among the flowers and pinned beneath the brute but as he looked he held his breath for when he had gazed hard with steady eyes upon the brute behold no brute was there but someone towering large against the skies a winged and sworded shape through whom the air poured as through glass and its foam tumbled hair lay white about the shoulders and the whole pure body brimmed with life as a full bowl and from the distant corner of day's birth he heard clear trumpets blowing and bells ring a noise of great good coming into earth and such a music as the dumb would sing if balder had led back the blameless spring with victory with the voice of charging spears and in white lands long lost saturnian years <laughs> 